Hello, welcome. My name is Ying Lee. I am the community programming producer at the Playwrights Realm. My pronouns are she, her. I'm thrilled to welcome you to our virtual stage today for an exciting panel. I also want to thank HowlRound for live streaming this event today. Before we dive in, I would like to go over some logistics and some information. The Playwrights Realm is a value-based organization and we center in our practice the values of being an equitable, inclusive, anti-oppressive, and anti-racist organization. These values extend to our virtual stage. So if at any time you feel you experience something that is not aligned with those values, please feel free to chat me directly or follow up with an email. I'll put some more information about our mission and values in the link in the chat. I'll link it in the chat. Connected to these values, we understand and recognize that there are additional barriers for caretakers. So if you incur any caretaking costs by attending this webinar, we'd be happy to reimburse you for those expenses. This is through our Radical Parent Inclusion Project. In the follow-up email that I'll send you tomorrow, there'll be a link to reimburse this. Um, and I'll put some more information about this in the chat. I also want to acknowledge that we are joining you today from the traditional and ceded territories of the, of the Lenape. Colonization is an ongoing process that continues to impact the lands and lives of Native communities. In addition to the physical land that we occupy today, the platforms, technology, and equipment that we are using also consume resources that are based in physical lands and are not universally accessible to all peoples and communities. I'm sharing a link in the chat if you'd like to learn more about the spaces we occupy. We're about to dive in. Um, before we do, I want to remind you that you can submit any questions you have in the Q&A. That's at the bottom of your screen. And feel free to upvote any questions you would like answered. Uh, we'll choose some at the end for our panelists to answer. Uh, Zoom now offers captions. Please feel free to turn them on if you would like. And I'm also sharing in the chat um, a program for today's event. They have our panelists' bios and information. Uh, feel free to check that out. And it is my pleasure to welcome you today to our virtual stage, the lead panelist for today, Hope Chavez. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Hope Chavez. I use she, her pronouns. I am calling in to you today from uh, Texas, actually. I am working remotely in a new location. So if you hear a dog barking, that's my best friend's dog, but we're all being humans in this space, right? Um, so I just want to thank the Playwrights Realm so much for introducing this, um, this conversation for us. I, I am deeply invested in having these conversations with amongst the producer community, but I am really grateful to have that cracked open here today um, with all of you so that we can have a live dialogue about this. Um, so I'd love to welcome the panelists and invite them to uh, take themselves off on camera, bring yourselves into this virtual space. Um, while they come in, I will say that this is such a, uh, I don't know, like I'm sort of in shock that you all said yes, because in this collective here are people whose careers I have admired and uh, followed for many years. There are new faces here to me. There are friends faces here, folks that I love to work with. Um, so this is just like a really warm and exciting space for me. And I hope it can be the same for you all as well. Um, so I'd love for you, um, I, I will help popcorn us around, so I'll like say who can introduce themselves. Um, give us your name, give us your pronouns, and then um, I'd love for you to just tell us like something that you're bringing with you into this conversation. Um, maybe a thought that you've been chewing on as you come into this, or 
um, an experience that you're holding or even just like your mood right now, that's all good. Um, I'm happy to start and to model. So I've shared my name and my pronouns. Um, I am I am the director of artistic planning at Long Wharf Theater. I also do freelance consulting and facilitation work, um, mostly with small and mid-sized nonprofit arts organizations, um, and then facilitation community work where I normally am living in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and I'm bringing so much curiosity into this conversation. Um, something that we talked about a little bit in the prep call that we had was like, who is the audience for this, right? Who's going to be here? And how does that inform the way we answer this question? Uh, we can't see who all of you are and this video will live on beyond this moment where we have this dialogue, but I'm thinking a lot about what does it mean to have this conversation amongst BIPOC folks um, who are producers are anti-racism lens versus the anti-racism lens that um, white folks who might be watching this are, are thinking and experiencing as they come to this work. So that's just something percolating in my brain. Um, and I will pass it over to Denzel. Hi, how are you doing, everybody? Uh, my name is Denzel Faison, uh, pronouns he, him. I'm the operations manager for the National Black Theater. Um, something I'm bringing to this conversation is a blessed perspective of always being around the National Black Theater since birth um, and always having a space to express my artistic vision no matter what and always feeling safe. Um, and I hope to uh, share my experience with that with you today in this conversation. Um, I pass this to Mayan. Hello, hi, I'm Mayan Teo. I use they and she pronouns. Um, I'm calling in from Lenape and Kronasi Lands, also known as Brooklyn, even though I am the Associate Artistic Director of New Work at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, which is a new job stepping in there. Here we go. Um, I'm going to be totally honest and I'm coming fresh from um, uh, an experience where I quit a directing job because the organization did not have the infrastructure to produce the play or any play safely. Um, it's a happy story in a way because they immediately shut down the play they canceled it and they canceled their season and they hired an EDI consultant and they're making actual change. And it was um, surprising to me, it was the first time I realized that stopping is a strategy. I've always been in the like, no, no, we can do it. We can like go, we can like whatever. Sometimes actually stopping to like pause and like see how we got there and like look at that it's very, very important. And I've never understood that in my life before. Um, and I, I really appreciate that I've, I've, I've gotten that experience. I'm gonna pass it to Sam. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sam Morielli. I use they, them pronouns. Um, first, also would like to honor and acknowledge that I, I too am on Lenape and Canarsie land in Brooklyn. Um, and thank you, Hope, for inviting me into this conversation. I'm so grateful to be in community with all of you and also all of you watching. I'm so excited for this dialogue. Um, myself, I would say I, I I'm a freelance producer, I'm freelancing right now. Um, I would say I'm an emerging producer. I hope to always be emerging um, and arriving to the moments that I need to arrive to. Um, my whole practice, I would say, is really rooted in facilitation. Um, so my freelance right now, I show up as a facilitator through producing, through actual facilitation, um, through anti-racism training and dialogue and workshops. Um, and through strategic planning, all of which are really exciting and fruitful to me. Um, and I think I'm arriving to, how am I arriving today? Um, I'm arriving, I was thinking about being, you know, uh, being emerging and what that means and how, how necessary conversations in our industry about care for the artist are and how on our, on my heart they are as a producer and also really desiring more conversations about how we we care for each other, like as producers collectively um, and help each other up. I think that uh, as a young producer of color specifically, um, I have been like, 
I've already had a really lovely career so far. I'm like, wow, I feel like I'm in all these places. I'm joining all these institutions. I feel good about the communities I've attached myself to um, and they span pretty regionally. Um, and in every one, I feel very exceptionalized and affirmed and uplifted and also find myself still not quite having the support that I asked for. And so I think I really am I, I'm coming into today's conversation, holding that, um, and also looking to all of you and this community to, to answer some questions about how we care for each other. Yeah. Um, so with that, I'll pass to you, Shaminda. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Shaminda Amarakun, he, him, um, calling in from the lands of the Wappinger and Quinnipiac and Gutsit people uh, here in New Haven, Connecticut, uh, where I work at uh, uh, the David Geffen uh, School of Drama, uh, newly renamed um, as their uh, director of production, uh, as well as uh, on faculty and uh, chair of the technical design and production program. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, coming into today, so, so inspired by what I heard, I, I also love to consider myself emerging, uh, despite, uh, you know, working, uh, working in this, in this field for a while, you know, I, I really love that framework, Sam, that um, we, we are always in growth, we are always learning, um, and we are at best, uh, or at least I am at my best when I'm in, in, in the growth and learning mode. So um, definitely consider myself emerging, bringing that in here, and uh, also just bringing in a whole lot of gratitude and joy. This, this, this hope you're right. This is a fantastic group, <laughs> uh, and I, I'm so honored to 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 get to at least uh, sit in, uh, if if not offer some thoughts. So thank you, thank you, thank you for for having me. This is uh, this is truly wonderful, as well as a whole lot of gratitude for um, uh, just getting to come back to work in person. I, I you know we we were all on Zoom. Last year, we were, we were completely online uh, at Yale, and um, uh, we did get a lot done. Um, but I just so so I just so forgot uh, the power and the impact of just running into people in the hall or in the street and just just catching up and just being being humans together <laughs> for for five minutes for ten minutes. Um, and so I've been loving uh, loving getting getting to do all of that uh, as as tough as it has been to come back and to figure out um, uh, what it means to come back differently uh, and not just replicate what we've had before. Um, so very much appreciated uh, just to be in space um, uh, with folks here um, and uh, connect as humans. So bringing that into the space uh, today. I love that. We're not quite fully back up at Long Wharf yet in person, but I, I share the moments that I've been back, I share that like, obviously this is why we do what we do. That, that need for those sparks, those spontaneous sparks. Um, so I wanna ground us with a little bit of context. So our question today is what does anti-racist producing look like? And I wanna offer that like, I don't know that all producers are necessarily type A linear thinkers, like highly pragmatic. And when I see that question, my brain is like, what are the 10 steps of process that I can offer to the room of like how you do this, right? Which is like a deeply colonized way of thinking and like not the truth um, of the meat of what's under this question. <laughs> so I want to invite us to as panelists to like work our way through this question in ways that don't have to look like direct answers. Um, and I also want to name for the folks who are watching um, that it will be it will be hard for us to talk about just racism because racism is inextricably linked to ableism and transphobia and homophobia and sexism and capitalism and all of these other structures. So so like know that we are holding that as the central point of the question and we're probably going to connect the dots to some other systems that have to e be dismantled at the same time as we dismantle racism. Um, and we're obviously going to speak in a very American context here. So we don't, those, I believe all of us work almost exclusively, if not, of course, majority of time here in the U.S. So just to speak to how we approach anti-racism work um, within the history of this land and the, these communities that we work with. In. Um, something that Sam challenged us to think about as we even begin to take apart this question is like, maybe we should talk about what a producer is first. And it doesn't have to be in like the 101 way. It can be more like, what are we responsible for? As we think about how we approach an anti-racism practice with producing, it's probably important for us to first identify like, 
what do we see ourselves as responsible for? What, do, what is our role, our authority, our power? Like, what is it that we as producers hold um, in process? So someone jump in for that. I think that's a call out, Sam. I think that's what that is. <laughs> so, um, I'm definitely, I mean, I'm happy to jump in first here. Um, I, I'm excited to hear all of your answers. And I think, um, and I also just deep gratitude for that context too. I think that as I just practice anti-racism, something I feel like I'm learning is specificity. Like specificity is key and something I crave is being able to speak to um, unique contexts. Like we're trying to, we're trying to name dynamics as they show up in a specific context. And it's only as we can kind of whittle things down to their essence, I think that we can really, really build on a strong foundation moving forward. Um, I the, the first definition of a producer that was kind of shared with me that really resonated was that we are charged with bringing um, an artistic process from concept to completion. Um, I don't think that necessarily needs to be like one entity, one institution, one producer. I think that shows can, I, I, I would say the producing process is it, from its concept to completion. And it probably has many folks who hold and produce along the way. Um, and I, I say concept to completion too, really specifically, because I don't think it's necessarily like, I think some folks think about producing as like, once the show's up, we're done, it's produced and now it's just on its like production timeline. But I actually think that there's still a lot of care that the producer should have as a show is running um, and sometimes even past its close, um, like a debrief, um, a consulting process, a check in with the team about how how they feel about the close of things. Um, and to the other part of your question of like, what what are we really charged with? I would say traditionally it's uh, as it's been shared with me, it's uh, the, the money, uh, a lot of the budget, a lot of the weeds financially speaking. Um, and I think deeper than that, because of the money, it's also about uh, the, the culture building of artistic teams. Like we are charged with holding the culture of the artists um, who, whose projects we are helping to steward and, and um, steer. Um, yeah, anybody else have thoughts? I saw you, Denzel, on mute, so I, I feel like I want to pass to you. Yeah, sure. Um, I wanted to speak to the fact, you know, simplest terms when I think about what a producer does, um, and it speaks directly to how you just how you beautifully beautifully describe what a producer does. Sam, uh, the producer's the glue. You know, um, keep everything together from concept to for concept to application fruition. Of a, sh of a show, an artistic piece, whatever you're deciding to produce. Um, the producer's job is to make sure that that uh, production achieves its goals, um, whether that goal is to speak truth to power, or whether that goal is to, you know, generate a certain, uh, hope, you know, generate a certain amount of money. Um, goals are, you know, they, you know, whatever the morality of the goals, the producer's job is to make sure that the production from start to finish uh, achieves them. Yeah, that all resonates. Um, I think a lot about what you're saying, Sam, with facilitation as someone who does both like community conversation facilitation and also produces. And I absolutely see them as uh, I, I recall when I uh, I started producing before I started before I became identified myself as a facilitator and received like training around facilitation. And I was so grateful for the um organizations that financially supported me getting those trainings because um, I see us to your point, Denzel, as the communication glue, especially. I think of, um, I, I'm gonna fail at getting the quote right, but you know, Adrienne Marie Brown talks about facilitation being about bringing ease to process, bringing ease to difficult conversations. Um, that doesn't mean they're easy, but to bring in at ease, right? To kind of like, <laughs> like lubricate the, the avenues through which we have to like get through these conversations and do these hard things of bringing in an ideal world, extremely diverse people and different folks of different lived experiences together um, in order to create art, which is highly personal and sensitive. Um, 
So I appreciate, I see, I see us as being really responsible for that, for the way in which folks communicate and the way in which um, power information and resources are um, allocated to folks. Is there anyone else who'd like to weigh in, Mayanne or Shaminda? Be happy to. I, I'm so inspired by you know what what you all offered, Sandy. I so hope um, absolutely concur. Uh, I I think I might just add um, you know uh, some some aspects about um, you know responsibility to community and uh, how you know we as producers producing uh, uh, organizations. Um, uh, uh, should be, I think, in service to, to the communities that uh, we gather together, uh, including those artists uh, and, and, and crafts of folk uh, who are working within our institution, but uh, not least so much the, the audience um, uh, that we invite uh, to or engage with by going to them. Um, I think we have a responsibility to them, particularly because you know, there's, there's always gonna be more work to produce than we have time and resources to produce them, which means our choices matter. Our choices matter in, in what we choose to elevate, right? Um, and uh, they should matter, but, but there's a lot of responsibility that comes with how we then make those choices, why we're making those choices, um, because, uh, because of the power we, we, we have um, uh, to have influence and, and, and hopefully that influence is for the betterment of our communities. Um, a hop in here, like, yes, 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 yes. And I want to continue like the baton that Shimano just like threw me. And I think it's, I'm going to say about what I want producers to have and not just what producers do. Cause Shimano just started, you just started going like, can we please do this as well? Right. And I think I long for producers to have a vision based on understanding the situation of what is in our society of how and what we make. So that the, the people who are holding these whole processes, the glue and all of that also have a vision of like, oh, this is what we should not do. Oh, how hard is it for people to have um, families and work in this industry? Thank you, Playwrights Brown. That's like some visionary stuff to be like, oh, you're here, you wanted that. You have a child, you need childcare, let's go, right? Like how can we actually be as producers deeply connected to the most vulnerable, to those who um, need more access? How can we really like be attuned to that and not just go for the most efficient and in terms of budget, in terms of all the things, how can we have a vision that is much larger than what is, is on the, uh, what is usually um, uh, the thing that we have to sort of like come to, right? Like how can our budget be our values? How can we actually think about those things in a way that's just um, um, beyond what we're taught to do or what we think we should do? Yeah. Don't even get me started on budgets, man. I had a hard time not making this conversation all about budgets, but we'll get there. I put one question in my list. I was like, I'm not gonna not talk about money, but... Um, <laughs> I get that. But like, okay, so so I I'm grateful for this like this like foundation setting and this seating, right? So how is it that we do that, right? How I would love to start with like folks sharing what is um how is it that we go about beginning and laying the foundation for these processes um, so that we are living anti-racism, so that as man said, like we are bringing our vision, and I don't mean our, like our singular, because a lot of us work within institutions too that are trying to, that, that have cast a vision for like the world we want, right? The world that we're striving for, the community repair we're striving for, things like that. Um, but how do we start laying that foundation from the beginning when we're brought into a process? And just to name, I'm curious too, um, if you feel comfortable, like Sam approaching that from a perspective of as a freelancer, right? What does that look like when you're coming into an institution laying foundation? Where are there challenges in that? And then Denzel, I'm also curious about how that's probably distinct when you're working at a theater of color instead of working at a predominantly white institution. Um, I'll speak first. Um, so uh, Angela's da uh, Angela Davis, I'm sorry, has a famous quote. Uh, in a racist society, it's not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. 
um, coming from the perspective of national black theater, anti-racism anti is has been embedded in its mission since its founding in 1968. Um, when you think of the when you think of the time of 1968 in terms of the civil rights movement, um, and then just the history of arts and theater in this country, and how at every step is really you know all, every every black artist and people of color when it came to the arts is really to quote all my life I had to fight uh, in terms of being able to have spaces and to practice your craft and to share your craft with the community and not be dismissed. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge uh, specific concepts, the specific context of racial capitalism in this country and how it uh, affects people of color. Um, and when I say racial capitalism, I mean racism as a technique for exploiting people of color and for fomenting hostility in working class white people towards people of color, color to enable uh, capitalists and people in power to extract value from everyone else. Um, yeah, it's this longstanding, it's common, it's super problematic in theater. Um, and that's at, the, that's at the crux, I believe, of anti-racist producing, acknowledging that and taking the steps to combat that. Um, like I said before, I come from a unique perspective of being at the National Black Theater all my life. Uh, pri uh, being at primarily white institutions for me uh, came from going to school, going to primarily white schools and experiencing it there. Um, yeah, that's my perspective on it. Yeah, thank you, Denzel. Sam, you're already getting so much love in this chat. <laughs> I know, I saw. Hi, Debbie Dio. Um, oh, no. My computer's freezing. <sighs> we can see and hear you, okay? Okay, I'm gonna pretend like nothing's happening, but know that I just see a frozen image of my own face. So I may need to jump from my Zoom. But if you can't hear me, just let me know. I can see like my captions coming up. So I'm assuming all is good. Um, I, I can't say that I can speak for all freelancers, of course. Um, I can only speak to my own experience here. And I, I, where do I begin? I'm like so excited by the visions, Shaminda and Man, that you offered for like producing moving forward that I already think like that's anti-racist producing. So I'm still try I'm trying to break from my like type A, my also type A <laughs> Virgo mind. That's like, I want to unpack this. Um, so uh, linearly, because I don't think we need to do that. Um, but something something that I know to be true as somebody still emerging and freelancing is that I um, I really like I, I honestly just like push against institutionally like all of the previous models of produce the, the models of producing that keep us just as managers and not as like pe people movers. Um, so which I think is distinctly the difference between a producer and an artistic producer or a creative producer, for instance. So I think that holding that title feels very important to me and just not sacrificing my values and my integrity as I move um, and attach myself through each institution, just still recognizing that if you hired me, you've asked for all of me, you've asked for all of me to show up. And so I'm going to show up with all of me, um, which might mean interrupting um, their systemic ways of processing and, and offering my own um, thoughts as to uh, how we should move forward with care for the artists that we uh, are trying to serve. Um, I have many more thoughts, but I'm very distracted by my frozen screen. So I'm gonna try to jump and fix this Zoom problem, if that's okay, and pass back to someone else here. That's totally okay. Hope I have something to say. Um, so I wanna, I, I just want like, yes to that. And also um, just hopping off of what Denzel like brought in about you must be anti-racist. So let's just say that if you're not doing anti-racist producing, you're doing racist producing. Let's just like, let's just say that that's the case, right? Yeah. You're either on the train, you're off the train, there's really actually no in between. And what if everything that you did, you actually were able to sort of go and say, how is this racist, given the fact that we are dominantly in a racist society? So everything that's there can pivot to being anti-racist. So every practice, every assumption that you might make about how you produce, every way you think about how things should be done could actually use a pivot. 
because that is that is that is the state we're in <laughs> where where it could all use a little examination and pivot so that's what i want to like name too like anti-racist producing almost is like oh what's that oh what are you doing and how is that racist like let's actually look at that right and put and put the onus on identifying what is actually there that is part of the system that has has been there um nataki garrett the artistic director of osf she says this thing when we're like oh like oh why is it so efficient or why is it blah blah, blah when all these questions the clarity of her line is who benefits who benefits from that who benefits so if re if, if producing has always been in a certain way and it has been racist we can ask who benefits <laughs> and then we can continue to ask how do we pivot that for anti-racist producing who benefits how right like what what what's that thank you also sorry now that i'm less stressed about my tech thank you for offering that clarity also just to build i think that part of the reason why i think we need to shift right from that old producing model that i'm talking about is also is exactly that question like i think that we as a nonprofit the or my experience of the american nonprofit theater industrial complex is that we have forgotten that we are nonprofits. like the point is not to make money in fact to the point is to reach a net zero um and i i what I experience of older producing models is that it is so focused on just the money making of it all, which is what capitalism wants us to focus on. Um, that also feeds into racism and all of the other systems of oppression, right? As opposed to keeping the people at the center and asking who benefits all the time in our process as producers who are who are asked to steward the resources and, and gift the resources and facilitate the resources, right? Like if we consistently remember, we're not trying to benefit ourselves. We're not trying to benefit the institution like as long as we reach our net zero we're good it's more important to take the time to breathe through and ask the question who benefits how can we shift what we're doing in order to support the artists in order to support the storytelling in order to support our local community um than it is for us to consistently thrive because I get again, like in the reminder of the nonprofit, it's like, if we fulfill our missions, we're supposed to sunset. Like the point is that like, once we reach that goal, we're done. Otherwise we wouldn't be nonprofits. I have a friend who has really uh, encouraged me to think about how nature composts and how can we compost? Like how can we bring intentional death in a cycle to a thing? And, and have it been like nourishing, right? The death actually nourishes future life and it makes fertile soil for future life. Um, so what does it look like to go through a process with that kind of intentionality of like, and we will end, whether it's the nonprofit or the show, right? How will we decompose this and then ensure that the that, that compost is like, creating more nutrition for our community as we continue to like grow again and and sunset so i just wanted to share that because that was beautiful sam uh shaminda do you want to add anything about like foundation laying in a process yeah thank you so much uh, i'm uh, really moved <laughs> as i as i knew i would be by, by uh, what's been offered uh, so far um uh what i might um uh, uh add is um you know, you said that how, how might we begin this process? And you know, for me, I think it uh, this does start with as as this, that was calling in um, an analysis of of those systems and structures that we are living in, uh, including those who have worked uh, on this for for decades, for generations. So folks like Angela Davis, um, you know, provide for us a really succinct and clear analysis of what is still going on in the world around us. Um, which is the same as uh, the analysis that Frederick Douglass was bringing into the conversation, uh, you know, a couple centuries ago around what was happening uh, in this land uh, and, and, and building off of the, the work and, and thoughts uh, going back even further, right? So, um, so there, there, there is, um, there's, a, there's, there's actually a science to this, right? This is not, the, you know, things that, you know, people are, are making up. There, there's a lot of research there. There's a 
a lot of analysis that has already been done that we should be also bringing into this because uh, you know, as 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 uh, Carmen uh, reminds us, and, and and Nicole, it's like without that analysis, you know, our, our concepts of you know trying to run one way in anti-racism uh, might be running uh, indirectly the the same way towards another racist <laughs> concept and structure because everything is so interlaced, right? As we are trying to solve quantity over quality, we might be leaning into paternalism or perfectionism, right? Um, you know, all of those things uh, are interlaced and we have to have that analysis to be mindful as we move forward. Um, but, but as we do that, I think also what's important to me to remember is um, it really isn't the beginning. Like we, we are not at the beginning. Folks have been doing this work for decades, for generations before us. Um, and I really love uh, Hannah Sharif's offering that, that we are part of that continuum, right? We are continuing on with their work. Um, and so to, uh, to think about this as a beginning, it might be a beginning for where you're at, but you are continuing on with generations of work. Um, so, so let that be a source of, of the foundation for you, because it is, <laughs> you know, this, these aren't original thoughts. We are building them off work of those who have come before in service of not just those around us, but those who will come after us, you know, many generations after us, those we won't see uh, even. That is why we are doing this work. Um, so it is a bit of a beginning, um, but really um, I think I think that's an apropos metaphor hope that that, that that decomposition is part of a cycle. It's part of a growth. It's part of a continuum. Um, and we are we are now trying to help along with that. Um, and you are not alone. Yeah, thank you for that, Shaminda. And I, I dropped this in the chat, but for folks who can't see the chat here who are watching us on other platforms, I want to amplify what you're sharing, Shaminda, and, and this idea of like compost. Um, we know compost to be something that helps sustain a larger ecosystem beyond the thing, the individual fruit or plant that decomposes, right? And so something um, I'm often challenged by working at an institution is the tension between, we often talk about sustainability, right? And that sometimes we make these highly efficient or practical decisions that might to your point, man, um, not benefit the individual artist, but benefit the institution because we're working towards what feels like a very righteous goal of like the institution's viability, the institution's sustainability, the institution's like longevity. And I'm constantly reminded of how the pandemic proved exactly the way in which that suffers artists greatly, right? And the way in which it leaves them with no safety net. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about this idea, Shamind, of looking at generations beyond us, looking at how what we do compost into a larger ecosystem. It's, a dip, it's like, who is it sustainable for? Sustainable for us, the institution, or sustainable for our community? Um, it's, a, it's a question I'm often grappling with. Um, in terms of foundation setting, I would love to just share with folks that um, in my experience, it's about the vulnerability of the producer that really um, that really sets the culture for the process that allows for uh, for us to become more aware more, and notice more um, where systems of racism, systems of all the isms, where the, all the isms show up, um, it really starts, in my opinion, with the vulnerability of the producer. How do we have those first conversations with folks? Do we start with values? Do we explain budget transparency to folks, right? Do we talk about how we like to communicate? Something we're starting to do at Long Wharf is talk about how do we want to engage in conflict? Um, if, we, if we start looking at conflict as a thing that is inherent to human interaction and not uh, not always evil and doesn't always mean harm happens. Sometimes conflict is just where difference meets. Um, then how, how do we want to engage in that together in a way that's like really thoughtful and accountable? Um, so I'd love to, I'd love to hear, and this is truly hope asking for like almost advice here. Um, <laughs> something I think about Something that I think we've all shared as part of our responsibility is taking care of artists, right? And um, and anticipating needs. I think traditionally it was how do we anticipate problems, whether they're technical, financial, 
uh, problems with time, problems with communication. But as we think about anti-racist producing being more holistic, how do we anticipate the human needs of people and how do we make space for that? And I'd love to hear how you all are approaching that specifically in a way that doesn't also then lead into paternalism. Because something I'm not interested in is uh, saying, well, I know what you person who shares a different identity than me is going to need. And I feel really great that I planned for it. And now I'm going to get defensive when you tell me what I did for you is not what you were looking for. I think that's, that's a, that's a slippery slope when we're like, I did an anti-racist thing, but it wasn't what someone needed. So talk to me about how you navigate that. Um, it made me, uh, once again, think about an Adrian Marie Brown quote. Um, you made me think of it before uh, when you mentioned them. Um, essentially, it boils down to when a facilitator needs to trust the people. Uh, and for me, I think that means, uh, I think for a producer and a facilitator, they should do the best they can to prepare for needs based on the needs that show up in their lives and their and the people that they know a lot and the people that they know and their lives and their other theater contemporaries. Uh, but let the people and the people being these artists, uh, designers that are part of the production process, let them dictate what they need um, and let you know what they need. Because it's, uh, you, uh, paternalism is very, once you dictate the speed of change or, or once you tell people what they need, you've slipped into paternalism and it's, um, very destructive to the creative process. Uh, so prepare for as many eventualities as you can based on your own experiences. And then when your artists come to you saying, hey, this is something I need to be the best that I can be in this process for me to feel safe in this process. Um, as a producer, you do everything you can to address the need. Uh, I mean, you may not be able to address the need exactly, to, exactly how the artist wants, um, but address it as best as you can. And then every time a new need comes up, you know, you now have that in your expectations or your event in your eventualities of, well, now that I saw this in this production process, I can keep an eye out for this in the next production process. But it all boils down to trust the people, trust your artists to let and give them space to let you know what they need. 110% echoing all of that. I think that, um... I think that white supremacy really asks us to be mind readers in our jobs. And that is humanly, um, unless anybody knows of some fun tech that I don't know about, I think that's pretty humanly impossible. <laughs> um, and so I think, and I think this is a lesson I have learned so clearly as a freelancer who I think also like can um, fall into the, tr the like colonizer trap of like coming into an organization as this like new third party and then not not just being paternalizing uh, like or perpetuating paternalism but also um, I think literally like coming in and acting like oh I, now this is mine and I know how it's supposed to move forward right that's also a colonizing tendency and I think instead of doing that, truly just asking the question, revealing, that's what I think producers can do is like, we can reveal all of the doors, all of the many possibilities that exist and also acknowledge that we don't know. Like I think claiming, I do not know, I do not know, and, but I am very interested in helping you figure it out and using the resources I have access to, to find the right door, find the right avenue, find the right window, whatever it is that you need. I think that being really clear about clear that I'm also showing up in my own humanity here. Like I, I know that we have an idea of what the producer is supposed to do. And I'm telling you, I'm not going to be able to fulfill, fulfill all those needs, nor do I want to perpetuate this other, this idea of what the producer is. So instead, how can you, the community that I'm trying to serve also help me redefine what it is that I do? How do we remain in that kind of reciprocal relationship instead of staying in, um, these the cycle of service that we've created for ourselves where like each show right like because because each show is a different community but we've created a system where each show comes in and we treat them exactly the same or like that's how we've we've been taught to produce right is that like every show comes in they have first rehearsal they get to opening night within like four to five weeks and then they have their run that's however long and then they get out and the next one loads in and we keep going and we keep going and we keep going but as we expand the canon and also see, particularly as somebody who works at predominantly white organizations, right? It's like when you bring in 
a black cast, when you bring in a multiracial cast, a Latine cast, an Asian American cast, all of the types of casts that are non-white, and then you start serving them the way that you've traditionally served white casts and white shows, you find that all of our systems are broken. They're not actually meeting these people in their humanity. Instead, we're just doing them a disservice, doing a lot of harm, um, and really just uh, doing a disservice to the whole creative process. So if instead we can pause to ask, how can I show up for you? What do you need? And then try to build systems for that. I know it's like, it is more labor, it is more time. And I wanna honor that that's true. And I also believe that like both of those things are abundant and I am ready and willing to give, right? Like I want to help usher those processes. So if that means um, breathing through it, pausing, changing a date, I want to I want to offer and open that door. I feel like sometimes, as you were saying before, man, we don't we just don't ask the question. Um, and it's as simple as saying, like, who, who are we serving? Who who is at the center of what we're trying to to build for and with? And how do we pause and breathe and give it the time and resources that it needs? I want to hop in there like, yes, Sam. And also, like some of those systems didn't serve white folks either. <laughs> Like they serve human beings. A real team. <laughs> it's like it's like okay. <laughs> Why do we work this way? Oh, do we have a life? I I I I really resonate with all of these. I think for me, it's about um, understanding what a culture of care is. So it's a, a a larger perspective of what it means to understand what yourself and other people with different experiences demographics and you know a mother uh, you know all, all of like all of these different things what people's lives actually look like and to actually care about the multiplicity of that um and then options so people can like opt for it or not <laughs> it's like that's where i think the paternalism can be really uh uh helped where people are like no i don't need the extra therapist like like and the extra support for that i'm good thank you right like it's not forced upon it it's just an option and then a constant loop of feedback so that like like that's what i think like people are saying like that so if you have a culture of care first of all people having that option will understand that that's like part of those details and then you have feedback people will actually tell you but if you don't have a culture of care people will not tell you because they don't think they're supposed to and you can say like what do you need but they wouldn't even go to say like i need child care because it's not the industry standard so the culture of care is really about breaking industry standard because that is capitalist and racist and patriarchal and actually saying culture of care is moving us into a place where we're actually understanding what people's lives look like and then operating from there with their agency and being able to listen. Yeah, again, I love, uh, I love all, all of these thoughts and um, uh, you know, particularly that, you know, that culture of care, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really resonating with, with me and, um, and, and that individ individuality that, that is necessary within that, right? Because, of you know the, the the initial question of how do we not just assume we know what's best for everybody right um, even as much as we might learn year in year out um, our lessons from the, the previous year with regard to the same exact culture and community uh, we are, are likely bringing in different individuals um, that have different lived experiences in that next year and so we, we still need to be attuned to what their their needs might be um, and it's super tough. I just want to name this like, I mean, the, uh, it's, it's really hard, um, uh, you know, particularly in our institutionalized si systems that, that we have here, uh, where things are so interlaced. Um, how do we, how do we slow down figuring out that question um, because of the knock-on effects, right? It's, it's not just slowing down for one individual, it's slowing down for a, the whole community, right? And what does that mean? And, and how do we all uh, get that? Uh, 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 get get into that project, right? Um, where whatever we're working at in the moment, um, there is a higher purpose. And when one individual uh, needs a bit more care, needs us to slow down, we are all on board with slowing down uh, to care for that um, uh, that community member, right? So that we can actually be a community and not just an institution that is moving forward here. All this portion to slow down, right? So we're trying to figure that all out. And I, what I've been additionally offer is. Um, 
uh, just just as, as my colleague Narda Alcorn or constantly reminds us, lead with love and lead with grace. Um, you know, uh, uh, we're going to make mistakes. You know, we're going to make a lot of mistakes. And uh, Nicole Brewer has reminded us often, you're going to do harm. <laughs> you know, people are going to get harmed. Like, we can't flip a switch and, like, all of a sudden we're in an anti-racist society. Like, we're still in that racist society, in that oppressive society, and harm is going to happen. Um, and uh, uh, if you're, but if you're leading with love, if you're leading with grace, also leading with, um, you know, I'm sorry, you're leading with, I'm here to listen first, um, uh, and then you're leading with care, right? And so, or proceeding with care. Um, so, so, so grace and love, including for yourself, right? As, as producers, as managers, uh, we, we do often take on a lot, shoulder a lot of the responsibility, shoulder a lot of the blame. Um, uh, because we are accountable, right? Um, uh, but that, that can destroy us too. And, and uh, as if we're not also mindful of the grace and love that we, we owe ourselves, we're not going to be that well of service to other people too. So uh, lead with grace and lead with love. I just really appreciate that offering, that like harm reduction offering, that harm reductionist standpoint too, because I do firmly believe that um, white supremacy built all of these systems that we now all subscribe to with a lot of violence, like a, a lot as we like, I, I could not even try to quantify in words the amount of harm that that communities have experienced that many in um, I know my generation like we are, some of us are actively experiencing some of us are just experiencing the the ramifications of choices made only really one generation ago in some, in some instances. But I, I really think that, you know, the way that we've been taught and the way we experience, like when you are, are a person in an institution that has a lot of resources, that is because of these systems of violences, this, this, this violent system, and giving those resources up or redistributing them is a sacrifice and that will hurt, you know? It's like, it's not going to feel good to get rid of these systems. And I think that that is something that I try to share in my own facilitated practices. Like it doesn't, this if we're getting rid of this, I don't think it's gonna feel good. It's gonna take a lot of work. It's gonna take a lot of sacrifice. It's gonna take a lot of labor. And hopefully we can do it, do the least harm as we do, we try to undo the violence that has happened. But I truly think like it's, not, it's the, the feeling, it's not gonna be very pleasant, but I, believe that what's on the other side is joy and love and kindness um and and pleasure right i think that right like if we want more people to have that others also need to recognize that there, there's first uh, uh sonia renee taylor talks about discomfort so beautifully and i would highly encourage everybody to go her, to her instagram and just watch every video you've ever seen you ever want to watch um but talks about these moments of change literal change where we're like shirt over our heads like in transition like that is that's that's it's just a transition moment. It is uncomfortable. Maybe sometimes it's painful, but we are going to get through it because what's on the other side is being the changed system that we want to be. I want to jump in and say two quick things. The first is what I'm hearing underneath all of your answers that we've said this earlier in the panel, but I want to really highlight it for the folks who are watching um, is that underneath all of this requires a deep self-awareness and deep self-regulation, right? We all are coming from a place where I will speak somewhat broadly, but I think we all share like an awareness of where our identities are, what our areas of privilege are, what our areas of, of oppression are, uh, what our uh, folks have mentioned, what our lineage is, what is the context of the space we're coming to. So starting, you know, like I think of it as so many circles, nested circles, right? We're starting with like first, you have to, uh, Carmen Morgan says this, facilitator, know thyself, right? So producer, know thyself, right? Know first where you are coming from um, and and also like your temperament, what, what kind of things trigger you? What kind of things do you need to like learn to delegate? Cause this is something you don't know how to handle yet with grace. Where is, um, where can you cede your own power and ego um, in order to step aside and say, you know what? 
I'm not going to know how to handle this as, as best as possible. So what I'm going to do is allocate resources to someone else who I can be in like a learner relationship with while I grow the muscles to do this thing. Um, but I just really want to underscore that because I have certainly seen folks who are well-intentioned jump immediately into what they understand to be anti-racism work or EDI work um, to go like really in the other direction to bring in like you know, as a white theater to bring in their first all black team and to be like, we did it. And then like, not as individuals have the awareness of what it is that they have to do for their personal work in order to do this community work. So also, man, just really underscoring this idea that sometimes a pause, sometimes a, a not doing is, is like really important. Um, but there, there's also threads here coming out in what I think Mayan and Shaminda and Sam have said here that in my mind touch to accountability. Um, so I wanna kind of get a twofer in here. There's a question in the Q&A, which folks I will pivot towards in just a moment um, that I think threads this as well. Um, but talk to me about your own accountability processes, whether that's you could share maybe individually something that you do to keep yourself accountable, because I will say like something we've identified is producers hold a lot of power, right? We do know where a lot of information and money and things live, and we often have the power, if not on our own, to persuade others to make changes in systems and in, and in process. So um, with that power, how do we hold ourselves accountable or how do we how do we address harm when it happens? Um, what does that look like in a producing process? Because I will say that is part of anti-racist producing. Again, looking at this as full humans, harm will happen. How do we um, how do we address that? Um, and Mayan specifically, I'm curious too, because this is one of the questions in the QA, if there's ways in which you go about, since you brought up feedback loops, um, creating channels that are safe and effective for that. I'm going to start first with what you asked um, and remind me if I don't get back to creating a feedback loop, but maybe maybe it'll be all be connected. So I went through an incredibly hard time at an institution I taught at and it required me to go through mediation with folks because um, the, the, the situation got so toxic and I remember going through training with the mediator and and now that I've gone through it, I, I feel like it's so, so powerful a learning in my life that I carry it still to today. And something that she noticed was that she said, um, um, I just want to name that when this comes up, like when someone accuses you of not being a good professor or like blah, blah, blah you get incredibly defensive. And I just want to point you towards uh, this book, How to Have Difficult Conversations, and these two chapters. And the one of the chapters was, when you get defensive, it's because your identity is fragile and that you actually don't really believe it or understand it is true because if you did, then you wouldn't need to get defensive, right? It, it's, it's just very simply like, that's a shaky part of your own identity. And you can actually assess that like, oh, why is it that I don't believe that? Or why am I afraid of that? Or what is going on really um, that makes me under, that makes me not understand that that's coming from their jealousy as opposed to my own understanding of myself, know thyself, right? What's going on there? So that was a very helpful concept for me of like, if I'm getting defensive, I can ask myself why. Why is it that I can just be like, that's not true, boom. Right? Like, why is it like awakening all that in me? That was one, that was one thing. The other thing is that there is no shame or blame. So if we move from a culture of shame or blame, we can actually move to a culture of contribution. So what that is, is if a situation is at hand, it's not any one person's fault. The situation requires everyone there. And there are different ways of contribution that got us to that moment. And the way to actually solve that is to both of the people or whoever else is to be able to like step and look at it together and say, how did we get here without any shame or blame? And I think that that, to be honest, is I think at the core of that, because we actually don't operate well with white guilt. White guilt does not help us at all. And white shame does not help us at all. It just goes to a, like a backlash. And also neither does my Chinese guilt or shame help me 
it goes into a backlash, right? Shame or guilt does not help. Now, what does help is us understanding, like, where is it coming from? What is, how is this happening? How has this been inherited by many, you know, Asian femme ancestors beyond, you know, like, oh, like what is actually happening there? And also with such grace and generosity to try to be able to heal that in myself so I can heal it back in the line of ancestry that it's coming from and also try to heal it in myself so that others can also be healed. So I don't perpetuate the shame and blame that we've been taught to, to, to handle. Right. So maybe actually facilitating a feedback loop can be helpful with this because sometimes people don't want to ask for feedback because they're afraid of being shamed or blamed. <laughs> Hello. I mean, who wants that? Right. So first of all, I think when you are doing that, you want to really ask yourself, what is it that you're really trying to assess and move towards as a vision that you're building together? And so in saying, I, I have a vision of making this institution or this new play development program or whatever, a place where people can really grow and like whatever. If you agree that vision, can you help me get there? And then you're really pointing towards the shared vision as opposed to like, please attack me <laughs> for what I didn't do well enough where we're not having a shared vision about. So I think like in any kind of feedback loop, like what is actually the thing that you are around? What are you actually trying to create together and do together? And then how can you be very um, specific about how to move that forward so that it's like it's not about it taking it personally. It's about, oh, that's not moving forward because of this, because, oh, I said something that tripped them up. Oh, I can actually continue my movement towards our shared vision and correct accordingly. Right. So that it's less about attacks and more about constructive um, understanding of what is. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Anyone else? Yeah. Can I jump in here? Uh, oh, my goodness, man. That is so wonderful. <laughs> I love that. I love the contribution framework, uh, the, the shared vision framework. And yeah, I've been I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, you know, because uh, I'll be honest, I'll, I'll be vulnerable here. I, I have a, I have a, um, a complicated relationship with accountability as uh, somebody who is always going to be the first of something in my role, right? So whether I'm, I'm the, I'm the first person of color in, in the roles that I do, or the first South Asian in the roles that I do, or the first Sri Lankan immigrant <laughs> in the role that I do, I will always be first and. That comes with um, that comes with a thing, right? That of, of 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 both responsibility and um, a mindfulness for those who will come after me, because uh, as much as we might want to um, deconstruct that pressure, right? Uh, people people are all looking at you as that first and wondering, you know, um, should we have gone with that first? Um, and what what in my mind, what it means for those who will come after me with those identities, um, do, do I have a responsibility to keep that door open for them? I do, um, but with that pressure of, um, you know, um, uh, not making mistakes, right? <laughs> uh, because I am the first. And so then looping into accountability, uh, absolutely I'm making mistakes left and right, um, but, but reconciling with them uh, and uh, being open and transparent about them uh, has uh, not just implications for me and my team here, um, but it has implications for the society that we're in uh, that, is, that is judging us and judging me as the first or the only uh, to have had this, this role and, and looking for reasons why, why, why they should not make this choice in the future, right? Um, and, that, and that comes back to, you know, um, not, just, uh, not just my... Uh, you know, traditional identity, Marcus, is just, it's also the fabric of who I am. And so, again, being vulnerable, uh, you know, I, I get criticisms for being a, being slow, being a slow thinker. I am a slow thinker. My, my brain is like in, you know, some thick molasses in the middle of winter sometimes. I move that slow and it, it, it creates challenges for, for those uh, around me. Um, and it has taken me years to even introduce the concept that that maybe that's not a flaw, maybe that's just me. <laughs> and the shared contribution that I've made and offered uh, is 
maybe with that element of me, which is not something wrong, it just means we have to find a different creative way to move forward so that I don't have to fix something in myself that is not fixable. It is just me. <laughs> but we now need a different path that maybe because of racism, nobody else has tried before, right? And we have to figure out that path where you have somebody who is a slow thinker working in a team of highly fast thinkers uh, to chart a path forward so that we can all feel like we are growing uh, and taking care of each other, right? Um, so, so thinking in terms of like, there's not something wrong with me, it's that I'm different and it's okay to be different. Um, and now let's talk about accountability. Um, uh, again, I think beautifully with that shared vision in mind, shared contribution in mind, what can we all do together moving forward, uh, not, with, uh, not with that shame or blame. I think it's for me, you're over there. Sorry, I just pointed to you on my screen. Um, but I think that's it for me. First of all, sorry, before I go forward, I would really love to fight um, whoever is calling you slow. How dare they? That is so rude and absolutely to uncall for um, in every context. But I think that what you're offering of like, you know, how do how do we ask these systems to change to hold us in our truth and in our fullness instead of trying to bend who we are um, as producers, as artistic communities, socially um, to those those powerful forces, right? I think that when I when I think about the question, how do we address harm when it happens? It's actually not about think. It's not about like okay, as it happens, let me walk you through what I do. It's actually I think to me that question is what are the systems that we asked of each other to create so that when harm happens, we all feel comfortable dealing with it. And I I, I know that I have a deep, and when you were talking about, um, you know, facilitator, know thyself, producer, know thyself. When I enter a community, I, sh I'm, I will like, as transparently as possible, tell you so much that you need to know about how I work and how I move in space. And, uh, and share because I, I want you to know how I would like to relate to you and also ask you and invite you, how would you like to relate to me? I think that we need to have many more clearer conversations. Something just broke in my living room. Don't know if you heard that. Um, uh, I think we have, need to have many more clearer conversations about how we would like to be in relationship with one another. And we really don't. I know that right now, again, in my freelance world, I have many asks coming in from theater institutions asking me to like build community agreements with uh, a team or a staff. And I think that, um, there's part of me that's like, oh, wow, these like little woohoo things like that with systems that we call on. But actually, I find community agreements so helpful. It is a system of accountability. It is a way, it is ways of being that we all have said, this is how we would like to relate and to work and collaborate together. And it therefore allows us to, to, um, to do the self-regulating. Uh, that you're talking about hope that is so necessary as we as we get back in person as we relate to each other generally um and i i really just yeah just really under that I, that was the thing i wrote down was understanding and, and um agreeing to ways of relating to one another yep i just wanted to add i, I agree with everything that everybody said it's wonderful to hear these things and it speaks to the uh value of communication and trust in building a culture of care. Um, you know, it, you know, it's funny, uh, the, we produce theater to tell stories, uh, but to get to the point of telling stories to the audience, we also have to tell stories amongst ourselves uh, as a, as the community that's creating the piece uh, or the artistic piece, I should say. Um, when we tell those stories and when we openly communicate, it leads to a greater sense of understanding amongst the community and it allows people to approach situations with a perspective they not, not they wouldn't have necessarily approached it before when they hadn't heard your story. Um, and I think that's uh, key to everything that's being said and the idea of building this culture of care. I'm so grateful for all of that. Accountability is a really, it's a really challenging thing, particularly uh, I'll reference back to the beginning when it's like talking about how the conversation amongst like if the five of us were just having a conversation together, I imagine it would actually look a little bit different than what we are having right now because we assume a mixed audience right, but when we talk about how do BIPOC folks take accountability, how do folks who sit at other intersections of marginality as queer folks as trans folks as disabled folks right, how do they take accountability within systems that are uh, 
not only oppressing them, but in, in many unfortunate occasions, seeking to make it harder to uh, for them to succeed, right? Not giving them systems of support and care. Um, that's, that looks a little bit different than the accountability um, processes that one might expect if they sit in as many buckets of privilege and majority representation um, as a white, abled, cis man, you know, heterosexual, like all of those. The more you go to the majority, the different, I think accountability looks different. Um, but I also feel very strongly about um, we all hold places of power and we also hold places where we don't have power. And in the, in the positions where I hold power in the spaces or the resources that I manage, if they have power over others, um, it is essential for me to remain accountable to folks. So um, just to offer a couple of ways in which that looks, what that looks like for me, um, uh, budget transparency with artists is a big one for me, giving an opportunity for feedback, um, an opportunity for me to have missed something, for me to like be wrong about how their needs need to be supported. Um, for instance, like to also speak to if folks are coming here from like really large institutions, you may be like, wow, the producer is way too removed to have all this like accountability and connection to community. First of all, I might challenge that and say why. Um, but the second thing I would say is, you know, use all the resources. I have my company management office do a lot of like the artist care and doing regular check-ins and facilitating feedback loops to ensure that we are constantly checking on the care of artists. Um, I'm in the space. I'm a face. I'm not just an email address and a human who set who is on a contact sheet somewhere as like a line of support, right? I'm I'm looking outside of a transactional relationship. I'm looking for a relational connection with folks. Um, so to allow for the accountability there, and then I have um, I have peers at my organization who I regularly ask for feedback from, um, and that's really critical to my process. Um, folks who can hold affinity space with me and call me in to account as well. Um, so I just wanted to share that. We have so many questions in the chat, which makes my heart just glow because that tells me that we are speaking some truths that resonate to folks and that's what you want. I also know we're coming near the end of our time. So I'm challenged to pick only one question. I kind of feel like that's realistically all we have time for. Um, I'm going to go with this question about, um, the ways in which a producer can support coming into a community. How can one assess needs and create real tangible outlets of support? Basically, where do you start? So I want to connect that with one other question that came in earlier, which was like, um, uh, coming in post covid too there was a there was a question earlier about how do we help folks who may not even know what boundaries are yet so let's let's talk a little bit more maybe in some tangible terms now cuz i believe we've been doing a lot of like heart centered talking which is important but let's maybe offer some resources here around what community care can look like especially if folks um you know are learning boundary setting we're all still i i gosh, I don't even know what boundaries are sometimes. Um, <laughs> so I'd love to hear from folks about that. And then I'll give us a quick close out question and we'll break. I would love to jump in first because I have an observation for my own work. <laughs> um, as I've been asked to like come in and facilitate and do community agreements, um, as we're in person again specifically, and I, I thankfully have had the opportunity to go and facilitate folks in person as well. And I, I can speak, I think, of my observation of community and also my own experience is that, y'all, we have, we, we have forgotten how to gather. We have forgotten how to gather. Nobody knows how to interact with each other anymore. We have, and I, I, we've almost, almost, not quite, but almost been like factory reset. And I think that there's a lot of excitement in that for me. For instance, I will speak for myself. I, my, my patience for whiteness, for white mediocrity, um, for white power, it's just so minuscule. It's so minuscule. And I have no, I have lost my white people filter to not just pop on somebody if they say something out of pocket. Um, similarly, I, I feel like I've found so, so much me <laughs> in isolation, just so much me that I refuse to keep in this little tiny New York apartment. Like I want to be 
as me as possible with all of you beautiful humans in the world in my work that is so it, it is important to me that when i when i step into my workplace i am not just worker producer but i am sam i am brown i am queer i am non-binary i am gender <laughs> i am like coming come from like a poor background like all of these things like they're a part of me and i i i would be remiss for my for my own sake not to show up with all of that and what a gift to be lost by everybody else <laughs> um so i think that as we when i think about like serving each other it's really um going back to asking for new ways of being and like being adamant like sitting in our integrity being adamant about what our boundaries are and instead of instead of just resubscribing to white supremacist ways of being doing what we all are speaking about here like truly just taking the moment to breathe through something ask the question say no you will not have my hours past x time anymore you know i think that we i know that at least for myself i'm coming back with a lot more fortitude to be able to do that and i think that 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 fortitude collectively is what it will take to create the systemic change within the industry um so offering each other grace um, and the opportunity to like meet those boundaries in the moment and say, oh, I no longer want this to be a way that I work. And then pausing, giving us enough time to say, great, yes. So how do we move and build forward with that, with that attitude in mind, with that need in mind, instead of, again, going back to how we were operating before. Um, as far as um, some when when I think of tangible tangible actions uh, when you're coming you're coming into a community as a producer, um, obviously first you have to identify the um, you have to identify the holes, identify where harm is coming from, um, identify where destructive processes are, uh, and that is you know that goes back to communication and that, you know, starts with communicating with the community, creating the platform for them to speak out about uh, what they feel is wrong. And that all, you know, make sure they don't fear, fear the idea of what saying what quote unquote, the wrong thing, um, especially because in communities of color, silence is violence often. Um, and so if, as a producer, you're coming into a community and you feel like you can just come in and change things based on what you know, you're not participating faithfully. You're just assuming things and that's paternalism. Um, so when you, uh, when you come in, ident uh, identify the issues with the community and build from there. That's always the first step. And just uh, be honest and humble about, you know, where you're coming from, what your perspective is. Don't act, don't act like you're something that you're not, you know, uh, you have to you have to know your limitations in in, in triaging or uh, building uh, a building a community, and then everything you say you you've got to back it up. You know don't don't pay lip service to don't pay lip service to the community. You'll lose the community. Everything you say back it up with some tangible action. Um, yeah, those are places. Those those are those are the things I think of when it comes to coming into a community as a producer and trying to change the culture or trying to better the culture. Any other thoughts? Well, I, I um, uh, I'll be honest. You know, the in what the the big challenge here is is still the COVID piece, um, and um, uh, on top of that, uh, within that, uh, the the actual real challenge is uh, not the COVID piece, but it's um, it's the anti-racist COVID piece. <laughs> Right, such that right, COVID is is a dominating factor in in our planning and um, uh, constantly evolving, right, from week to week still, uh, and it is not going to go away anytime soon. Um, but uh, how we approach it, uh, that has to be different, right? Um, but it is challenging us because it is. Uh, uh, inviting us, seducing us <laughs> to lean into every single bad past practice that we've had and how we address 
major challenge, right? It's like, you know, every situation, um, you know, the, the, the 14, 15 characteristics of white supremacy is like, we're, we're leaving into that to solve how we're going to do masks um, uh, for our community and social distancing and, and vaccinations and vaccination att attestations um, and, and dealing with the guests coming in and out uh, and rights and privileges. You know, we are, we are, we are being invited to lean back into all of those bad past practices um, and how we do so in an anti-racist way, I think. Um, uh, that is the real, that is the real task at hand. Um, because there, there, there are, I, I genuinely, I, I, I believe in that framework that there, we, we're dealing with twin pandemics, right? The COVID-19 and the COVID-16-19 pandemic, right? You know, and it's, um, it is, it is up to us to um, live up to, I think, what, what, what Sam so briefly brought into the space of to actually be different. You know, I'm, I'm different now after last year. Um, but it's up to me to remain different <laughs> and not get sucked back into um, into the, the, the pre-COVID um, more racist uh, um, uh, structures and systems and thinking that I also had. Um, so, so we have to challenge ourselves um, as we go through COVID planning, continuing with that, of how we also do that in an anti-racist manner um, and not just lean on the, the, the previous techniques we've had before. I love that. Oh, go ahead, Denzel. Uh, I was going to quickly say um, thank you for sharing that, Shaminda. Uh, really speaks to me the idea of leading with empathy uh, when you approach when you approach these things. Co you know, co COVID is so devastating and destructive to uh, you know people's health, both physically and mentally. Uh, how we operate as a society, and we talk about how we're falling back on old habits um, to try and solve it. You know, it seems like. COVID hit and the first thing, one of the first things that got thrown by the wayside in terms of thinking about economics was the arts, artistic organizations, so on and so forth. Uh, it, you, know, we, you know, it's not, cons uh, it, it, we, arts organizations already have it hard enough as it is in my opinion to, to prove to everybody, to prove to the world in general that we are essential. Um, and so it's you're falling, but fall, falling, COVID hit, and now we're falling back on the habit of thinking, uh, oh, the arts, the arts aren't essential. Um, when it, when in reality, it affects such a large intersection of our society. Um, everybody's connected to the arts. The, the arts isn't separate from arts. The arts aren't separate from capitalism. The arts aren't some uh, luxury of society. Um, so yeah, just remembering to lead with empathy when coming into an organization and don't fall back on habits of saying, well, what are my goals for coming in and doing this? Is my goal to make money? If that's your goal, you shouldn't be coming into the community to do that anyway. You're, you know, if that, you should be expecting to expend resources. Um, and you just have to, as a producer, you have to, or a potential change maker, you have to truly believe in what you're doing and come in with the right reasons. That's absolutely right, Denzel. Um, and just to share my own response to the question, I would say um, the thing that's hard about this to answer in a straightforward way is that it's about creating a culture and a culture as emergent strategy teaches us is an iteration of small things, right? It's, it is the act of all, it's this fractals. It's all of these little things that create an environment, that create a culture. So it's really, I think the accumulation of um, you know, you're in a Zoom meeting with your pre, you know, having a pre-production check-in for the first time with your artistic team and you offer your name and your pronouns. You ask everyone to share their pronouns. That's an opportunity, a reflection that you're not making assumptions about people. Um, it's at asking about access needs. It's about letting folks know about those options. Like May Ann said, you know, everyone should know we're going to have a community care consultant who's going to be able to speak with you if you ever have any needs throughout this process. Here's the form where you let us know if you need access to child care or to, uh, you know, mental health care or anything like that. Here's the resources that we have to offer. If there's something not on this list that you need, please be sure to speak out to X person, right? Um, 
it, it's it's about the accumulation of all of those little things. It's about creating moments of check-in, whether that's you know your company manager, your production folks, whether that's you going into the space on a regular basis and just you know finding folks on break. It's that it's creating that culture of availability, of access, of um, flattening some hierarchies to make sure that information is readily available, creating a culture where folks get answers and resources so that they learn to trust. I often say that my favorite thing is actually being called into accountability and told something doesn't work because that signals to me that people trust me not only to receive that information with enough grace, but they're telling me because they probably think I'm going to try to do something about it. So I actually don't see it as a failure that I get now more than even at the beginning of my time at Long Wharf, critical feedback, offering ways in which we can change and we can grow and we can expand because that tells me the systems are working and I have helped successfully create a culture that allows for feedback, that allows people to feel safe enough to say what their needs are and what they um, want in a process. So it's hard to say what exactly to do to create that community of care, but if you're if you have that internal awareness and you're offering your your team the resources, I think to learn how to begin to create these channels, um, Racism doesn't just show up as in someone using an offensive term on somebody, right? It's the assumptions we make about what people need and how people ought to be treated. And everything we do can be questioned as man offered for us in the beginning. And Sam shared this with us during our prep as well. Like the beauty of being a producer is that we can change so many things. We can change almost all of it. Um, not necessarily alone, but we can change anything we want to. So why not always ask ourselves that question of um, why are we doing this and who does it benefit? Um, so I want to thank you all so much as panelists for being here, for attendees as watching. I hope that this is a, a valuable resource. Um, I will not speak for everyone, but I will say as myself, I'm available as a human in the world and eager to continue having these conversations and being in relationship and being in service of this ecosystem. Um, and I imagine the panelists are eager to be resources as well. So um, just thank you all. And if you wanna share a parting like shout out folks, if you have something you wanna plug, if you wanna say anything as we close, I'll give you a moment to do that and then we'll, we'll peace out. I took so many notes from what you all said. I just, <laughs> I think I got more out of this than uh, I was able to contribute. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Play Rats Realm. Thank you to all of you. Um, uh, so much love and honor to, to, be, to be invited to be here today. And uh, let's stay in touch. And those listening, uh, please feel free to reach out as well. Yeah, I'm just gonna quote Shaminda. We are not alone. You are not alone. <laughs> and we're in it together. Thank you. I agree and echo all of the gratitude. I am like uh, so hungry for more truly, which I think is a great place to leave is that I feel like we've just barely touched the surface of where this conversation can go. And I'm grateful to now be in community with so many beautiful people um, who I already was and, and newly people and want to bring you forward to the community that's watching. Feel I'm on the internet, find me, um, scoop me up uh, while I'm hot um, and I do really just hope to continue this conversation with all of you in some way. I, I think that producers, institutionally speaking, like you're pretty isolated. Um, there's often just like a, either a tiny producing department or one person who's like has that title of producer. And I think that this kind of cross collaboration and coalition and cross institutional um, relation building is so, so vital to the future of our field. So thank you all for your thoughts and your wisdom and your knowledge. I, I'm truly grateful for being a part of this, and thank you for inviting me. Um, this is actually my first public panel. Um, usually I'm behind the scenes, you know, writing questions and prepping it. So it was an honor to be a part of this, and um, I hope to be a part of many more. Yes. All right, beautiful humans. Thank you all for your time, your labor, your insight, your wisdom, your everything. Thank you for bringing your full selves. I'll see you later. Mm -hmm.